Uh, in this video, I'm going to go through the OCR AS level chemistry paper. Um, uh, this is the 2020 paper. It's paper two. Um, that's depth in chemistry. I'll just do the first half in this video and the second half in a later video. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So the first question is about nickel reacting with high dilute hydrochloric acid as the equation. Explain in terms of electrons whether the nickel is oxidized or reduced. Right. Okay. So we've got nickel uh, chloride there. Right. Obviously, that's an ionic compound. Chloride is Cl minus, and there's two chlorides, so it's got to be nickel must be present as the Ni2 plus ion there. Okay, so nickel has gone from nickel metal to the Ni2 plus ion. Uh, so that means it's lost two electrons. Lost electrons, that means it has been oxidized. Okay, next question, All right? Uh, so the student reacts 0.192 grams of nickel with um, 0.15 mole per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid. Calculate the minimum volume of the acid you need. So I've written the equation there again. So we can see here that one mole of nickel needs uh, two moles of hydrochloric acid. Okay, so now, we, let's work out the moles of nickel that we've got. We've got a mass of nickel there. So uh, mass of nickel, uh, sorry, moles of nickel. Is equal to mass over AR. Okay, so we've got 0.192 grams of nickel. The AR of nickel is 58.7 atomic mass. So that gives us 3.27 times 10 to the minus three moles. Now we said earlier here, you have a look here, we've got um, one mole of nickel reacts with two moles of hydrochloric acid. So the moles of HCl that we're going to need then is going to be double that, 2 times 3.27 times 10 to the minus 3, which gives us um, 6.54 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay, now we know that the concentration of the um, Hydrochloric acid was that. So we're going to use this equation here. Uh, volume is equal to the moles divided by the concentration. So 6.54 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 0.15. Uh, that gives us 0.0436. Three significant figures, it will say three sig figs, but we've got to convert that into centimeters cubed. So we're going to times it by a thousand. So that is equal to uh, 43.6, it's been dm cubed there, 43.6 centimeters cubed. Okay, now we've got to uh, calculate the volume of hydrogen gas that would be produced at RTP. Right, so um, we know that the equation there from before, I'll just write it down, uh, nickel plus 2HCl and to nickel chloride and H2. So we can see there that one mole of nickel is going to give us one mole of hydrogen. So the moles of hydrogen was equal to the moles of nickel. Now we worked out the moles of nickel before was 3.27 times 10 to the minus three. So the volume of the hydrogen in dm cubed 
well, one mole of any gas will be as 24 dm cubed. So that's going to be 3.27 times 10 to the minus 3 multiplied by 24.0 dm cubed. Uh, that gives us 0 0.0785 dm cubed. But it wants it in centimeters cubed, so I multiply by 1,000, 78.5 centimeters cubed. Okay, the student repeats the experiment with 0.192 grams of magnesium instead of nickel using the same volume. State and explain whether the volume of hydrogen produced would be greater or smaller than, than this value that we have just calculated. Right, so this is the same equation essentially with magnesium. because So you're going to get magnesium chloride and hydrogen. So we can see there, again, one like with a nickel, one mole of the metal gives us one mole of hydrogen. And the moles of the metal, well, that's going to be equal to the mass, which is 0.192 grams, over the AR. Now, the AR of magnesium is smaller than that of nickel. It's 24.3. So therefore, we've got more moles of magnesium. Therefore, more moles of Mg. So therefore, we've got more moles of hydrogen. So we therefore, we've got a bigger volume of hydrogen. You basically, you get more magnesium atoms in the same mass than you do with the nickel. Okay. Here's a six marker in organic identification of ions. So you've got three sample of three nickel compounds. You've got the bromide, the sulfate, and the carbonate. Okay. Student doesn't know which sample is which. Describe the test the student could carry out to identify the negative ion in each sample and write equations for any reactions. Okay. So Let's test for the bromide ion first. Basically, you would get your nickel to, you get your sample, dissolve it in water. Um, they would all be soluble, except for the carbonate would not be soluble, probably. Um, so anyway, if it does dissolve, even if it doesn't look like it's dissolved, some of it might have dissolved. Uh, so you can test for bromide ions. How do you do that? Well, you acidify with nitric acid and that's to remove any that's basically to remove any um, carbonate hydrogen carbonate or hydroxide ions that may be present which will interfere with the test and then you add silver nitrate solution if you've got a bromide present you will get a precipitate precipitate uh, it's going to be a cream precipitate of um, uh, silver bromide. Now, it does ask for an equation. So I'm, rather than an ionic equation, I'll, I'll give the full equation. So it's nickel bromide. Let's do that. So NIBR2 it will be. The nickel is a 2 plus ion, as we've seen before, bromide 1 minus going to react with AgNO3, aqueous solution, these are both in aqueous solution, and we're going to get a precipitate of AgBr, right, that means we're going to have to double that, yeah, and what's going to be left over is going to be nickel nitrate in solution, all nitrates are all soluble, let's be Q, um, this will be a this will be the cream precipitate, this one here, okay? So you get a cream precipitate and you know you've got bromide. And then if you want to double check that cream precipitate, actually you might want to say the cream precipitate, which will re-dissolve 
in conch ammonia only, not dilute ammonia. That's the chloride that will dissolve in that. We'll redissolve in conch NH3. I don't think you really need to say that in this case, though. Right, how would you test for test for sulfate ions or nickel sulfate? Um, well, you'd use the barium. Uh, you test with barium chloride, and you get a precipitate. So first of all, what you do you you dissolve it and you'd acidify with nitric acid again, or hydrochloric acid is fine, but obviously not sulfuric acid. Uh, that will get rid of any carbonate ions or hydrogen carbonates present, which will mess up the test. And then you add barium chloride solution. And if there's, you will get a white precipitate of barium sulfate, if there's any sulfate ions present. So again, let's write down the equation for that. Right, so we're going to have barium chloride, aqueous, plus um, uh, our nickel sulfate. Nickel sulfate will have that formula because S, uh, nickel is a two plus ion, SO4 is a two minus ion. And you're going to get barium sulfate, white precipitate. And what will be left will be nickel chloride in solution. Okay, and it says, as I say, this stuff is the white precipitate. Finally, we need to test for the carbonate ions. Now, most carbonates, apart from group one carbonates, are insoluble. So you, if you try to dissolve it, it probably wouldn't dissolve. Um, Put a bit of distilled water in. You don't have to put any distilled water in. Um, or just add directly to this. Well, you need to add an acid. I would probably add and, uh, hydrochloric acid. Add dilute hydrochloric acid. If you've got any carbonate present, you're going to get effervescence. Uh, and the gas produced is CO2. And you can confirm it's CO2, you can bubble through lime water. And it'll turn it cloudy if you've got CO2. Right, equation for that one. Right, let's start with nickel carbonate then. Nickel carbonate, that's a solid. Uh, and you're going to add hydrochloric acid. You're going to produce nickel chloride, which will be NiCl2, Ni2 plus ion. So you need two of those. You'll produce, that will be an aqueous solution. You'll produce CO2 gas. And you'll also produce water. That equation is balanced. Okay, we've got an entropy of combustion. Uh, calculation here. So what is the enthalpy change of combustion? Is the enthalpy change. When you burn one mole in excess oxygen, so you get in complete combustion, and probably best to say all reactants and products in their standard state okay right now on for the calculation part okay so we've got calorimetry experiment here okay so you're going to burn some cyclohexane in the burner. And you're going to use it to heat 200 centimeters cubed of water. The temperature goes up from 21 to 41. So delta T is 41 minus 21, which is 20 degrees C. Okay. And right. 
let's uh, we'll, we've got this much cyclohexane. Uh, cyclohexane is C6H12. So I'm going to just write down the MR of cyclohexane there. That's going to be 84. Okay. So we've got to calculate delta H combustion. How are we going to do that? Well, the two equations we're going to need are we want Q is equal to MC delta T, where Q is the quantity of heat released in the experiment. And then we need to scale Q up for a mole. So for delta H combustion, Uh, that's going to be equal to Q divided by the number of moles of cyclohexane burnt. Okay, so let's work out Q first of all. Right, the mass of the water is going to be 200 centimeters cubed. Uh, the specific heat capacity is 4.18. Uh, the temperature change is 20 degrees C. Uh, and for it's 4.18 joules per gram per Kelvin. That's important, that's joules, because our answer is going to be in joules here. So Q is equal to 16,720 joules. Now we, took, we need to convert that by using this equation here. Well, first of all, we need to work out our moles of cyclohexane. So let's do that. Moles of cyclohexane is equal to the mass of cyclohexane, 0.525 grams, divided by the MR, which is 84. Incidentally, while we're just mentioning that, a sort of a big mistake here is that what people make is they think that's the mass of cyclohexane, and they think that is the mass that goes in that equation, that is not the mass of, that's the mass of the water, obviously, because you're heating up all the water, the water is like 200 centimeters cubed, so that's 200 grams. And as I say, that is a pretty common mistake people make. Okay. So the mass in that is, is the mass of water heated up, not the mass of stuff you've burnt. Right, so moles of cyclohexane, we work that out, that is equal to 6.25 times 10 to the minus three. All right, so let's do find a part of the equation then of the calculation. Sorry, that so Q, Q over moles. So Q we've got there 16,720 divided by the number of moles 6.25 times 10 to the minus three. That's going to give us a really big number because remember that's in joules. Um, that gives us 2,675,200 joules per mole. Right, we obviously want that in kilojoules, so we're going to divide it by 1,000. So we're going to go, that's equal to 2, and we want it to three significant figures here. So what we're going to do there is, we're going to lose that five, so it's going to be 278, isn't it? 2780 kilojoules per mole to three significant figures. And really important here, it's an exothermic reaction, so we've got to put a minus sign in there. And if you don't put your minus sign in there, you'll probably lose one mark out of, you only get four for doing the whole thing. So you lose a quarter of the mark just for forgetting to do that. So don't forget, really com another really common mistake. Um, don't forget your minus sign, ex exothermic. Combustion, of course, is always exothermic. And you can tell it's exothermic because the temperature went up, of course, as well. Right. Right, the student finds that experimental value for delta H combustion is less exothermic than the data book, which is always the case, of course. And why is that? Uh, well, it's, there'll be a later question there. Oh, in fact, I missed a question out there. I think I have. No, I haven't. Right, anyway, it'll be a later question. It always says, 
why is it smaller? And of course, there's two reasons. The main reason is heat loss to the environment. Not all the heat goes in there into the water. And the other one, you could say maybe there's some incomplete combustion as well. They always ask that. And there's two best reasons. Okay. Um, right. We've got to work out uncertainties first, though. Right. The uncertainty in each reading is 0 0.05. Now you'd have to take two readings. Okay. So the total thermometer error is you're going to have to double that. If you take an initial temperature and the final temperature, that's going to be one degree C. So let's work out the, the temperature error. So that's going to be the uncertainty, which is one, divided by delta T, total temperature change, which is 20, multiplied by 100. That gives you five that's a percentage. 5%. Okay, let's do the volume of water error now. Well, the uncertainty is two centimeters cubed. And the total volume of water we measured out was 200. Multiplied by 100. That gives us 1% error. So which gives us the, the greater percentage uncertainty? It's down to the temperature, okay? Which gives us a 5% error. The volume only gives us a 1%. So the temperature is the one there. Okay, I think. Okay, this is the one I was question I was talking about before. Two reasons why the experimental value for delta HC is less exothermic. Okay, the, the main one, which always most the one that is mostly due to, is you are getting heat loss to the environment. Not all the heat goes to heat that water up, a lot of it goes to heat the air up around it. And secondly, which is probably less important, is you will also get some incomplete combustion. There are, okay, the first one would, would be the proportional for most of that error, actually. Okay. Now, in the experiment, the water in the beaker was heated for five minutes. The student thought the experiment could be improved by heating the water for 10 minutes. Explain whether the accuracy may or not be improved. Okay, right. So if you heat for 10 minutes rather than five minutes, that means delta T will be bigger that means the percentage uncertainty in the temperature measurement will be lower. And you may think that that will make it more accurate, but it probably won't. And the reason why, and you, I would say this, you might not have to say it all for two marks. The reason why you would probably make it less accurate if you heated it for 10 minutes, because the water would get hotter. That would, Basically, you'd get, when you heated it for longer, you'd get greater heat loss. And so the, uh, uh, <clears throat> you would not, even less of the heat would be transferred to the water, and that would give you a bigger error. Uh, and as long as you mentioned both of those, I think you get the two marks, but I would have thought personally that the, a 20 degree C rise um, if you, is pretty big. And if you heated it up to, um, then if you're going up to 60, you could be getting a lot of it and getting quite a lot hotter than the environment. And so you lose more heat, I have to say all this. And also you'd be getting evaporation of the water. So you lose that for latent heat of evaporation and so on. Um, but if you just write down what I've written there, you will get the two marks. Okay, five marks, not quite a six marker then, but quite a long descriptive question. Um, the table shows the melting point and electrical conductivity of two elements in period four, calcium and bromine. Use your knowledge of structure and bonding, explain the properties in the table. Right, okay, first of all, calcium exists as a metal, so it's a metallic lattice. Um, 
So it's going to have a high melting point. Why is it going to have a high melting point? Well, you've got uh, strong electrostatic attractions between the metal ions. and the delocalized electrons. The metal, of course, a metallic structure is um, a regular arrangement of like positive ions in a sea of delocalized electrons, the usual way of describing it. Okay, and you can explain the conductivity of calcium there as well. It's going to be good uh, conductivity because it's got delocalized electrons. I think that's probably getting us two or three marks so far for what we've written. Now we have to say about bromine. Well, bromine has got a low melting point. Minus seven. Well, why is that? Because, well, Br, well, it exists as Br2 molecules. Simple covalent. So that means you've only got weak interactions. Between uh, the molecules. Those interactions, of course, are temporary. Uh, dipole dipole interactions. Or London forces, if you want to call them that. They're weak and you don't need much energy to overcome them. It's always as well to say that thing about energy, energy to overcome when you're talking about melting points or boiling points. There's usually a mark on the mark scheme for that. And uh, you know people tend to forget that because it's kind of, they just think it's obvious, you won't write it down. Uh, and then finally, it, it's, a, it's an insulator and won't conduct. Why is it not? Because there's no delocalized electrons. There's no ions either. There's no charged particles to carry the current. Okay, that should, so you can really say for your five marks. Okay, calcium reacts with bromine to form calcium bromide. Draw a dot cross diagram to show the bonding in calcium bromide. Well, calcium is in group two. Two electrons in the outer shell and bromine in your period. So it was a halogen, of course, it's got seven, it's group seven, seven electrons. Right, what's going to happen is the bromine is going to take one from the calcium. So let's draw the bromide ion. There's going to be two bromide ions for each calcium as well. So here's our bromide ion. I'll draw it a bit bigger than that so we can put the electrons in, a bit too small. Okay, so it's got seven of its own electrons. And then it's got another electron. Which is got from the which is taken from the calcium. Uh, we just draw the calcium. Well, the calcium hasn't got any electrons in its outer shell. I'll just draw that two plus there. Um, uh, that's going to have a minus charge on the bromide ion. And there's going to be two of those. Okay. Right, the reaction of barium with bromine is more vigorous than the reaction of calcium with bromine. 
explain why. Well, if you look at your periodic table, you have got in group two, you've got no beryllium, but you've got, um, uh, got magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium. Right, as you go down group two, those atoms are getting bigger. And you're also getting more shielding. This is more shells of electrons. Okay, so this explains why barium reacts with bromine more vigorously, because when barium reacts, when barium and calcium react, they both lose electrons. And it's easier for barium Uh, for the reasons we said here, uh, the fact that you've got more shielding and you have got more um, you've got more shielding and you have got more and you've got bigger atoms so they're further from the positive nucleus. okay definitely worth mentioning that further from the nucleus. And the nucleus is positive so that stops the electrons. Um, escaping. Getting lost, sorry, not really escaping. Right, now, um, I am going to call, stop that, uh, the video there. I'm going to finish that next question in a later video.